Thank you, everyone. Um, we're both over and under time, so that's kind of weird, but we're going to start. Um, so I am a program manager on Azure DevOps team, um, which is a product formerly known as TFS. So um, before I also introduce myself a little bit more, I want to get to know you guys. So by the show of hands, who here identifies as security professionals? OK, most of you. Um, developers? Many of you. Um, DevOps, Ops, SRE, whatever that's called today. OK, cool. Um, so who here knows what CI, CD means? OK, pretty much everybody. OK, cool. So this is my assumptions from now on. This is cool. Um, so my last conference, someone told me that I have to have a really large picture of myself on my first slide. So here we go. I'm on the left. Um, <laughs> So I am a, like I said, this is a product that we um, use to um, both do work planning, um, do repo hosting, and do continuous integration, continuous delivery, which means your code goes faster into production, which is good, but it also can be a security problem because, it, you know, if you have bugs or vulnerabilities or flaws, that can also make it to production faster, right? So this is something we need to be thinking about when we're working on it. Um, my Twitter uh, handle is DivineOps. You should absolutely follow me and tweet everything I say. So that's a mandate for now. Um, so I will start with a story that happened about a year ago, which I was personally involved in. So my background is development and then DevOps. So I wasn't really um, involved deeply in security. Um, and then last year, one of the major cities in America, they got hacked by ransomware. Um, and I was part of the team that was deployed to help them remediate, and we were there for about a month. Um, and I've learned a lot of interesting things while I was there um, about how not to do things primarily. Um, so the ransomware attack, that was an attack that um, it actually did a brute force on weak passwords, so that's what happened. They weren't even doing anything smart, they were just guessing passwords. Um, the hackers were in there for months, if not years. Nobody knows how long. Um, there was a lot of security warnings that were raised. There was probably 2,000 sec known security vulnerabilities for the city. Um, nobody paid attention, right? Because that was kind of organizational fatigue. Once you get to 2,000 warnings, nobody's really like paying attention to anything anymore. Um, and so basically, when, when the things went down, everything went down, right? Because the hackers took their time to infiltrate absolutely everything. So all of the workstations, all the applications, pretty much 95% of everything owned by the city was down. Um, now, if you think it's not that big a deal, right? There's some government computers, okay? Um, but this was police applications. This was court systems. There was just anything that's related to parking, anything that's great, related to utility bills. Everything was down. But the court system was probably one of the worst because, like, they literally lost evidence for criminal cases, so they couldn't prosecute criminals because they couldn't access the databases. Now. In addition to that, of course, because this, the situation was so dire, um, they also didn't have any remediation procedures at all. So there was no backup for anything, there was no recovery, there was no source control for many applications, everything was black box, everything was deployed by a vendor 10 years ago, nobody knows where it started. Right? So our efforts to try to remediate them was like, okay, where was your last backup? It's like, maybe we have a backup for, for the database from two years ago. Maybe we have a VM backup from a few months ago. We don't know it's, if it's any good, but that's like the best thing we can find, right? So no common processes, no mitigation, no anything. Um, the bill for this, so the ransomware was about $50,000. They decided not to pay it, which I can understand because Again, you don't know if you're going to ha get, get hacked and blackmailed you know, in the next months if you do pay it. Um, but the, the estimated bill for remediation efforts is now about $10 million. Um, and and it, it's not even finished, right? So the, the bills that you might end up paying um, after not paying attention to security for a long time can be very, very bad. Um, so this is kind of... so the. Another interesting thing that I learned there that I didn't know was that this is actually not rare at all. Um, this happens all the time. People just typically pay the ransomware. 
right? So this particular um, ransomware was found in a lot of government facilities and a lot of hospitals, a lot of universities, because these are typically people who don't have IT budgets and don't have security professionals, or at least they have low paid security professionals, which are, you know, self-taught and not that good particularly. And so these people don't actually follow any kind of procedure and they are vulnerable to such attacks. Um, and the only reason, again, this made the news was because they actually didn't pay the ransomware and it all went down. Um, so, I'm gonna, this slide is hard to read, but it's here because it's kind of cool. Um, this guy is Michael Hayden. He's a former director of NSA and CIA, and he published a book and went public with some of his experiences. And so his quote is, um, you know, basically, fundamentally, if someone wants to get into your systems, your software, your organization, they will get in. Given enough time and resources, anybody can be penetrated. So the new approach that we have is that we assume we have been breached, right? So at Microsoft, our attitude is that we assume that we have been breached or we could be breached at any moment. Um, and so that changes our focus from trying to protect ourselves to trying to detect and remediate um, things that could potentially be happening. Um, so. We're going to talk about security practices. I only have half an hour, which is not a lot of time, so hopefully I get to everything in here. Um, but so we started with the assumed breach. So again, this is a mindset shift, right? Ten years ago, we assumed that if everything is, um, you know, if we have a firewall and it's CorpNet, then it's secure, right? Now we don't assume that anymore because um, that is potentially a very dangerous assumption, right? The firewall is necessary, but it's not sufficient for you to protect your stuff. Um, so anyway, then, then we're gonna go into protecting credentials, uh, open source vulnerabilities, threat modeling a little bit, um, uh, lateral movement, and then automating security and pipelines. Um, and I'm gonna start with the Red Team War Games because they're really cool and probably my favorite. Um, but I'm going to give away a little bit of the answer to the question in the title, right, is can we automate security? The answer is yes, but not quite, right? So we strive to automate a lot of the parts of it, and we have automated some things, um, but so far our tools are far from being sufficient, and so a lot of this is just also training people. And then the training people becomes how do you actually make developers and DevOps people care about security, because a lot of them don't. Right? So that's the hard question, because you walk into these rooms and people primarily want to build stuff. They want to build cool stuff. They, they see security as someone who comes in and stops them from delivering nice features into production, right? So the War Games really actually helps with that, and that's why I'm kind of starting with this, because this really helped us um, change the mindset a little bit on the team. So this is uh, one of the dashboards. This was probably... Uh, four or five years ago, but this is one of the dashboards uh, for one of the teams, and it's not really supposed to do that. <laughs> Usually when you load it, it's not supposed to turn around. The reason it, do, it is doing that is because so when we do red team exercises, and so we designate a red team, and they try to break into stuff, we ask them to prove that it actually worked, right? Because the value of seeing something is better than just talking about it, so it's not like, you know, this cross-site vulnerability can open up your database, right? Instead, they're actually doing this. So this is relatively harmless, of course, but it does make you care <laughs> about this. Now, what they did in this particular attack, they actually, they created a work item that said, okay, there's a cross-site um, vulnerability. And every time someone loaded a dashboard, um, it actually upvoted the ticket. Uh, because they had access to the database. And so this was 280 upvotes before it got remediated. So that's like, yes, this was in production. Yes, this is great. Um, so, and again, so our, we have guidelines for the red team. Um, so one of the things is like, so do no harm, right? Then this is like, you should not compromise humans or harass humans or share their personal information. So like if you got like stole someone's badge, like this doesn't mean that you're gonna shame them on social media or whatever, right? Um, the other thing is do not impact availability of any system and do not impact paying customer stuff, right? So you can mess up our own internal databases, which are a lot, like we have internally over 100K users internal to Microsoft because we have 130 
4,000 employees, so 100,000 of them are using this product, right? You can mess up internal stuff. You cannot mess up paying customer stuff because, you know, they don't care that we're doing red team exercises and they do not want to, you know, have messed up production. Um, and then uh, don't perform destructive actions. So that means, like, if you find vulnerability in the system, don't make it worse, right? <laughs> don't open it up wide open to other people and stuff like that. And then, obviously, you create a repair items and do a SLA and do a report readout and do some kind of proof that you actually found these things. Um, and also, uh, again, depending on the, the security level of the things they find, their remediation is like, you know, can be from like right immediately waking people up to like a couple of weeks to fix it. So we did, we did start with a red team and a blue team. So at first we were doing like, we had a designating red team and designated blue team. And there was an event like a war game. Um, so <laughs> first thing we did find is the red team always won. Like, not only did they win by a landslide, but the blue team actually had a problem finding them. <laughs> like, so the, the red team would actually leave some clues for, for what they did, and the, the blue team would be clueless as to what was actually happening. So it was like literally so bad. That started 2015 was the first time we did the exercise. So now, the other thing we did, we, we stopped doing the blue team because uh, we you know, think that hackers don't usually call us when they start you know, trying to hack into our systems. So the realistic stuff is like, you should care about security all the time. Um, so there shouldn't be designated protectors. Everybody should, in theory, be a designated protector. Um, and the other thing is we did, so we started with, you know, assuming no internal knowledge. Now we do assume internal knowledge. So you, you can, when you break into our systems, you can leverage everything you actually already know about our systems uh, because we assume that this could have been leaked and so someone might be familiar with some internal Microsoft stuff. Um, they still kind of always win, but now it takes them a lot longer and it, you know, it, they get access to a lot less things. But yes, it's kind of scary. Um, the other thing, so someone was, I think there is still going on the capture of the flag event. Um, so, you know, kind of a targeted exercise when you can try breaking into stuff. We conduct these two. Um, I think there's been like three or four of them so far. So we also do like security training, like, you know, you get a presentation and you need to do some exercise and stuff like that. But this one's actually really fun. Lots of people sign up and, they, and then we deploy a website with known vulnerabilities and then you get challenges as to like, you know, breaking into particular things. Um, people really enjoy that um, and they learn a lot. And again, it helps them kind of wear the security hat. Um, and another thing that happens is that increase the awareness of people. So like, we can hear people saying like, oh, I don't want to show up on the next red team report. Right? So this generates empathy because beforehand, like, when, like it's human, right? We're like, we're Microsoft, we're smart, you know, all good engineers. Like I, I read a report about Sony being hacked and it's like, oh. How dumb can people be? Like, why, why is that server not secure? And then once we started doing the red team exercises, people were like, oh, holy crap, my stuff is out there. My stuff is vulnerable, and I am doing these things um, that potentially are exposing our production systems. Um, and then this is actually pretty recent, Azure DevOps Bounty Program. So this started, I think, in January this year. So. If you discover a vulnerability in um, our system that you can prove, um, document, and it's reproducible, then we will pay you money. It depends on the severity level, uh, but we can pay you up to $20,000. So you are all welcome to try to break into our system. <laughs> um, this allows us to leverage community to discover our vulnerabilities and give hackers an incentive instead of actually breaking into our stuff um, to you know, get the price. So this is for the red team games. Um, it did, so one of the lessons learned is it did change culture. So it kind of made security much more top of mind for people. Um, and then we did discover which attacks are like working very well. So one is the, like the um, phishing attacks. So te teach a man how to fish and he will always have, you know, um, money. Anyway, so, so basically that, and then um, lots of different things in terms of how we can automate and prevent lateral movement. So 
The next one is going to be protecting credentials. So this is the two widest back doors out there. This is for, from reports in the industry, right? One is credential theft, and the other is exploiting known vulnerabilities. So um, the hackers actually changed their playbook. So the, it used to be all about anti antivirus, like you know, viruses and malware. Um, now there's not a lot of viruses and malware. A lot of attacks are phishing. Um, so 50% of people click on phishing links within the first hour. That's kind of sad. Um, and the other one is open source vulnerabilities. So um, we thought, again, we thought we were smarter than that. So this was, again, something, an example from probably four or five years ago, back when Windows phones were still a thing. Um, we send an email saying, like, here's this phone. It never actually existed. Um, you know, you can sign up for a preview, get the phone for free. 44% of people clicked on the link and signed up and gave their credentials to the phishing attack. And only 2% of people reported the attack as potential phishing. Right? So not doing so well. Now, we have did some We've done some training, we've done some education. Um, emails like that no longer potentially get at least not 44% of users. But if we send an email that um, looks like an email from your manager with his picture and his name, and it says there's an urgent incident, you need to sign into the system to remediate it, it still gets a lot of clicks, right? Because people click on it before they even think about it, and then they give, give someone their credentials, and then they move on before they realize this was even an attack. Right. So highly, highly efficient thing. Um, the other great example for this is DNC, Democratic Campaign in the United States. They got fished by, so uh, campaign chairman got an email saying you need to reset your password for your Gmail account. He actually highlighted it and sent it to the IT guy. The IT guy typed that the email looks legitimate and then like now he's saying he meant to type a legitimate. Nobody knows if that was really what he meant or not, but um, the chairman did reset his password and so the hackers got his credentials and for seven months they got all the emails from the DNC campaign and got lots of dirt on the DNC campaign that leaked to the media and all of these things. So um, nobody's really um, immune to that. So. The, the biggest thing is just do multi-factor authentication, right? Especially for your production systems, because you really can't protect from people accidentally clicking and thinking that the system looks legitimate because the hackers can, you know, fake the system looking very much like the production system. So the easiest way is to, like, yes, I know it kind of is annoying to enter a password twice for everything or, like, use your phone or whatever, but it is the best way to protect against this. The other thing that we do now is we do link wrapping. So um, when, we, when you, if you have this feature turned on in Office 365 and some other emails, you can do that too. We wrap the link. When someone clicks on the link, the first thing we do is go check the website and see if that has been attacked or potentially flagged. Um, the reason we don't scan emails in the first place is because the A gives us a little more time and B, maybe that link is not going to get clicked by anybody and then why scan it? Um, so this does give you kind of an additional protection option. It does look weird though, like to humanize, like you can no longer tell what this is. Um, so credentials and code, this is preaching to the choir, don't put your credentials in code, lots of people do. There's a lot of, in, you know, in open source projects, there's millions of credentials. Um, the good news about this is that there are tools around there, so like we have recently released this as an extension, um, so you can now use something called CredScan that is um, in Azure Pipelines, and so you can trigger, so what we do is we schedule automated build that includes that thing for pull requests. So when people check in their code, um, before the code gets merged into master, we trigger, trigger this build on pull request. So this will fail and prevent you from checking into master if we have identified a secret. Um, and we're not the only tool out there. There's tools that are doing this for GitHub. There's tools that are doing this for other types of repositories. So you can definitely protect your code. It's a great idea because people may not even realize they're checking in secrets or, you know. Um, so definitely something that can be automated. Um, this is a big one too. So there's the second biggest vulnerability. Um, so there's lots of websites that um, talk about, so, so again, I will not be exaggerating if I say that 100% companies now use open source software, right? Um, 
including, again, everybody, unless you're writing all of your code from scratch. So once you do that, um, you're kind of exposing yourself to uh, known vulnerabilities. And so what usually happens is someone writes code that looks OK. Then you know, two years later, someone finds a way to use that to break into a system. And that becomes known. Once that becomes known, there's a lot of people who are paying attention to that and trying to use that. Um, but the problem is that the regular software engineers in normal companies are usually not the ones paying attention to that. So the poster child for this is Equifax. Um, they actually got hacked through an Apache Strats vulnerability that was new, known for two months by the time they got hacked because people were not updating packages in Equifax and hackers actually spent two months trying to scan the internet for people who were using this package. Um, they broke into Equifax, they spent another two months inside of their network. Um, they broke into, I think, 51 databases, stole millions of credit cards and personal information. Um, boom. Right? So, you have, again, this is another something that can be automated at least to a large extent. Uh, we do use our friends from White Source, so we do um, use them to scan our open source packages. They're sponsor of this conference. And there's other tools like that that can help you identify known vulnerabilities. Um, and again, great idea to scan your packages because like, your developers are not going to pay attention and realize that something was released on you know, Hacker News and whatever. But you have to be uh, able to identify it and get notifications for it. The other thing is we do, so for our production, all the package sources are scanned. We don't have external open so, uh, um, external package sources. We don't have external docker, docker image sources, right? If we consume external packages, that gets listed explicitly as a check package and then goes into an internal source, right? And that's something that's not that hard to do. You can definitely do that, so that's a good idea. Okay, threat modeling, I'm not gonna, and I'm kind of, okay, I, ha I still have some time. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot of talks in this conference on threat modeling. It's a good idea to do threat modeling. It allows you to identify potential flaws in your system before the system gets built. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple things. Like one is we don't currently use software to do automatic threat modeling because so far the tools that we've tried didn't work so well. So uh, you know, they produce lots of false positives, lots of noise, and not a lot of useful information. So we use humans and whiteboards. <laughs> That's the extent of automation here. Um, the other thing, so the limitation of threat modeling is that you can't force all the people to, do, to update threat models every time they write a line of code, right? Because then you would never be releasing any software. Um, but you know, a single line of code could potentially destroy all of your security and expose your website completely. So this is, again, a good idea, especially when you're building new features, but has some limitations. Um, lateral movement, so this is a big, big deal. Um, this is a very popular quote, a lot of people use it. Defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers will win. Um, the thing is, like, most of the security people do have a checklist. Right? And then they go like, okay, I have a firewall, and then I de deploy my security rules, and then I check this, and then I have TLS 2.0, whatever, blah, 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 secure. Right? Hackers, the way hackers move is that hackers move through uh, doing, going in, um, you know, breaking into one vulnerability, leveraging it to break into another, right? So every little thing that you do can potentially expose you. So this is a, Example of a file that we found, again, the, some of the first red team exercises, we found lots of different credentials and file shares, right? So lots of people use files like this, be like, oh, well, it's a test account, and it's a safe and secure share internal to Microsoft behind a firewall. What could happen? So what happens is that the hackers go in, and they open the file share. Then they get the plain text credentials. Then they get into your... Uh, VM, potentially find a VM where the test account is a local admin. Then they use some tools to get other credentials from that VM. And then they get your dev and uh, credentials or potentially your production environment credentials. And this is how it goes, right? So like, um, yeah, OK, I'm going to skip through this one. Um, 
the best idea for this is, first of all, don't treat anything as just tests, right? There's no just tests, there's no just dev, there's no... Um, the great idea is not to deploy, um, you know, things that are demos with um, default passwords and then use them for production. That happens a lot, right? POCs become in production, especially for complicated things like Kubernetes clusters. Like, hackers actually have a list which is like, okay, these are the default passwords and the default security configurations for the Kubernetes clusters, and you'd be surprised how many of them are actually in production for a lot of big companies. Right? And the other one is isolated production. So what we do is we have no standing permissions to production. Literally nobody has admin permissions on anything. We do just in time, so either certificate or passwords that allow you to elevate the permissions. Um, we do, again, things that separate different levels. Um, we, we access production only from secure workstations. We deploy it only from certain things. Right? And we do it um, deployment in rounds, which is another level of protection. Um, before it makes it to production, you have other, you have time to catch some things. So, um, yeah, and so, yes, this is another thing. So this is actually good news about the cloud. Um, as we move into the cloud, we do tend to um, automate our infrastructure deployments, which means that potentially there's no long standing servers. So like infrastructure is a lot more pliable. It kind of goes away. Um, sometimes, and so this is good news because usually what hackers do is that they hack into a server and then they start using that to get into other places in your network. Um, and that usually takes a while, right? So um, if you don't have any servers that live in your production for six months, that's actually good news for you. Okay. And then, yeah, so regular deployments, encrypting. And again, the, your infrastructure being in code means that you have to make sure that you're not having the credentials in the infrastructure as code or security or um, certificates. Okay, so secure and compliant pipeline. Um, again, this is something we do um, in our tool in Azure Pipelines, and this is something that's available in some other tools as well. Um, so you, we have pre-configured, and I showed one example of this, we have pre-configured builds that before code goes into master, we do something that's called master, uh, trunk based development. So everything goes into master. Um, but before your code gets committed into master, it runs through, and it potentially can run through different CI builds. And you can put different tools that you are using into these CI builds, right? So we have, um, this is not the slide I went. So we have different tools that we use internal and external in terms of these builds, and we check um, different things for different deployments as well. So this is another thing. So we rotate secrets actually on every deployment. Um, so A, everything is in key vaults, and B, everything is rotated on every deployment. Uh, because beforehand, we didn't used to do that. And then whenever we tried to rotate secrets, something broke. So we just decided that we're going to rotate them all the time. In that case, we have to automate and make sure that it always works. So again, no long-standing credentials. Um, these are tools that, so we've been um, working for a long time trying to, these are internal tools that we use, right? So this scrad scan and this kind of scans binaries and this scans TypeScript and all sorts of things like any malware, um, things like that. This has been in development for a long, long time. Um, there's a bunch of different internal tools for um, static code scanning and detection and all th things like that. The reason we haven't deployed that, it, it made it publicly available is because it's hard, right? Um, it's, it's hard to not generate noise, it's hard to not generate false positives, um, and it's hard to actually give you good value for, for your, your good bang for your buck with these tools. So it's a complicated problem to solve in terms of automation, but there are some tools out there that are highly recommended. And again, there's plenty of uh, representation at this conference for people who are doing some type of scanning, uh, both static and dynamic code analysis and stuff like that. Um, and again, these are tools from us. Uh, GitHub just uh, acquired Dependabot, so now they're doing this also scanning in GitHub repos. So basically, this thing identifies uh, known vulnerabilities in open source pa packages and will try to update your repos to the new version which has the remediation. The only problem with that is that um, for open source projects, not necessarily the remediation doesn't necessarily come really quickly, right? Because on average it takes 100 days for people to actually remediate vulnerabilities. So that's another issue that you need to pay attention to. 
Okay, so um, I'm under time as usual, which is a miracle. Um, so basically, these are the things that we talked about, right? So assuming breach and acting always as if you've been breached and thinking more about mitigation and remediation instead of protecting yourself. Um, and again, protecting your stuff is also important. Um, protecting your credentials from theft, and again, this can be automated to some extent, right? So with MFA, with cred scans and stuff like that. Uh, protecting from OSS vulnerabilities, again, pretty good tools for this. Um, and then doing things that involve basically people, right? So red team exercises, capture the flag exercises, um, threat modeling and stuff like that. Okay, you can clap now. Thank <laughs> you.